The music world moves fast. Want to stay up to date on the latest albums and get in-depth examinations with the artists? Check out Consequence of Sound, the podcast. Bite-sized album reviews for the music fan on the go who wants to stay in the know, and much more. Subscribe to the series on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider and let the writers of Consequence of Sound steer you right. Check it out at consequenceofsound.net slash COS podcast. Consequence Podcast Network. Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. If you're not already a subscriber of the series, I hope you take that moment to hit the subscribe button to keep up with all of the interviews that I put out every single week. Uh, one Monday, Wednesday, and Friday every single week over Consequence of Sound. It's a lot to keep up with, but you're a music fan, so uh, yeah, why not? Of course, you can subscribe anywhere you get your favorite podcasts from, like iTunes or Apple Podcasts. You can also uh, follow along at YouTube or Spotify as well. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, Donita Sparks of the band L7. L7 are back with a new record called Scatter the Rats. It's their first full-length album in 20 years. And I'll be talking with Donita Sparks about what those reunion sessions uh, were first like. Also, the, the great talent the band have always had about balancing substance and humor. And speaking of substance, this is the band that created Rock for Choice way back in the early 90s. Unfortunately, it hasn't stopped becoming relevant, but it's definitely more relevant, uh, especially right now with Alabama in the news. So we'll discuss that as well as putting the new record out on Blackheart Records, owned by Joan Jett and their history with Joan Jett. Uh, we'll talk about the songs Burn Baby and Stadium West, and then we'll play the big round numbers game, turn the clock back for the 20th anniversary of Slap Happy. It was the band's final album before that breakup. We'll talk about what the environment around the band was like at that time, putting a record out independently in the late 90s and uh, and really stretching out on the, what the sound that they had been known for as well. After that, it's 1994 for the album Hungry for Stink. This was the first album after they had uh, had their big breakthrough with the single Pretend We're Dead. We'll hit on that and the singles Andre, Stuck Here Again, and Can I Run, and a song called Fuel My Fire played a very important role with this record because Prodigy would end up covering this on the Fat of the Land record, which sold like a bajillion copies and really saved L7's career, financially speaking. They're one of my all-time favorites. It's Kyle Meredith with L7. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here in Louisville. So you, this is the first full album in 20 years? Yes. Scatter the Rats? It's powerful. <laughs> it's so spinal tap. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we like the record. Do you like the record? I love the record. Right the fact on. that you know, we're playing Stadium West, too, and that's such a fun single. I mean, yeah. What you've always done. The great thing about uh, L7, uh, one of the really impressive thing that I've always loved about you all is, and, and I think you talk about this too, it, it's balancing like heavy issues with, with a lot of humor. Mm -hmm. Like that comes in your songs. Yeah. Going back into that, and maybe it just comes natural to you, but going into Scatter the Rats, it, was that still the focus? Like we do want to take on some really big themes here, especially as we heard on those first two pre-singles from the record, but but you've still got to, you know, have fun with it. Well, we, we are not contrived in the sense that in the way that we write, we just really write from from personal experience, and because we're rot, we're kind of wisecrackers anyway, that that sort of um, sass comes into our songwriting anyway. I think if we were to have a case of the sinceres all the time, we wouldn't that that wouldn't be our strong point. You know what I mean? Like some other people are really great at just pouring their heart out in really wonderful ways, and we're just a little too maybe we're too guarded or I also think that we've had to be such tough cookies in rock and roll for mm -hmm. so long that we can't really go soft. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, maybe a little bit here and there, but like there have just been too many battles to show any vulnerability. You right. know what I mean? Right, right, right. Well, but, you know, I'll bring a few of those up and, and hopefully I've got these at least close to what's going on in the songs because uh, Fighting the Crave uh, with addiction and, and, and Burn Baby with, with feminism and, and Holding Patter seems to tackle some depression uh, and and this isn't new for you all, like I said, a, a, at all. I mean, you can trace this all the way back to uh, starting Rock for Choice, which was early 90s? 
That was early '90s, and um, yeah, we've always had uh, we've always had some cultural commentary. You know, Susie's always pretty good at writing about dysfunctional relationships. Mm-hmm. Like she'll go there, I kind of won't. But um, I would say "Holding Patterns" probably the most vulnerable song on the mm-hmm. record. So that was written quite a few years ago when I was in a depression and very stuck. And I just thought it was a good song. And so I, you know, threw it to the band and they said, yeah, let's put it on the record. Because I think it's a universal theme of like, you know, I mean, I would listen to public radio all the time. I listen to public radio all the time. Well, thank and, you. I, and I would hear people being interviewed in, in my in my depression. And I would be like, oh, my God, like I am just so disconnected, you know. So, um, I mean, we've always had kind of a balance. I, I brought up Rock for Choice. Is that something you all are still involved with? Because it seems like now's a good time for that. Now's a great time for that. But I feel it's a younger person's game mm-hmm. at this point to step forward and start putting in some time and some effort into playing some benefits for choice and for other cool causes. Because we've put in a lot of time on that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I just think it would be really cool if younger artists were speaking out a bit more about that. I would say in our world, you know, in the uh, public radio world, especially a lot of the artists, uh, most of the songs I'm hearing right now are reflective of some way in, in that. And uh, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we had uh, an artist in earlier this week, uh, Emily Wolf, uh, and her new song is completely speaking about that. So I feel like that flag is being waved to some mm-hmm. degree, maybe less so in the uh, the mainstream pop world. Maybe so. In the, in the mainstream pop world. I mean, there's a lot of neon signs that say feminist behind some of these pop stars on stage. It's like, cool. All right. Well, how about playing a benefit for, for a, a, a woman's cause, you know? So I think it's one, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, walk the walk a bit. And um, I think, you know, but it's it's sometimes if you're a mega pop star and you stick your neck out like that you lose half your fans mm-hmm. so i i kind of understand it but if you're a gazillionaire who cares right so burn baby feels like that's uh, that's kind of heading in the direction that we're discussing right now well burn baby was based on a party i went to and i saw a bunch of peers that i hadn't seen in many many years and i was just like oh god that person oh god that person you know and then I was driving home from the supermarket, and I was like, well, God, at the end of the day, we'd all burn at the stake at this point. I mean, we're all sort of on the same side. Even if we have personality quirks that irritate each other, it's time to all kind of, you know, circle the wagons and uh, get over your crap. Have you been watching Handmaid's Tale? I have watched Handmaid's <laughs> Tale. Yes, very good. Yeah, I'm hearing a bit of a uh, bit of the storyline, uh, you know. I in suppose that, yeah. there is, but or there's a parallel at least. There's a, there's a lot of female sellouts on on Handmaid's Tale, though. You know, so you know you got to uh, choose sides. Choose your side. L7 right here. Burn Baby. It's 91.9 WFPK. Again, I'm here with Anita Sparks of L7 talking about this record, Scatter the Rats, which I see is released on uh, on Blackheart Records, which uh, Joan Jett's uh, uh, record label writes. Joan Jett is the mogul of Blackheart Records, and we are very happy to be on their roster, on her roster. Yeah, you've got a, a long history. I, I remember seeing on, a, on 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 the discography here. There's even a, a live recording of Cherry Bomb that you all did together. Well, there is, and and you were speaking of Rock for Choice a moment ago. Uh, there was a Rock for Choice concert in Los Angeles that we put on, and Joan came out for that, and we were the Black Hearts for a night. So we played. Oh, wow. Yeah, we backed her up. So that was really cool. And uh, I don't even think she. Yo, yeah, she did have a guitar on, but um, that was cool being. Uh, a non-front front person yeah. for me. You know, it was kind of like, wow, cool. <laughs> All the heat's on her. That's great. You, you can hear the, the touchstones musically of how that connects really quick. You know, I, I was thinking when you all started, you know, in the 80s, and especially, you know, when, when the big spotlight came in the early 90s and stuff like that, I mean, chunky guitars were everywhere. And now it almost seems so out of place that you hear a band like L7 with those type of riffs. I mean, I don't know. Do, do you ever feel like a band out of place, out of time? We've always kind of felt like oddballs, you know? So I know that producers that we work with 
are really jazzed on us because, you know, they tell us there just aren't many bands like us, which is a band playing with no no tapes, just completely live and playing just kind of meat and potatoes rock and roll and with distortion and, and feistiness. And, you know, we're a rock and roll band and it's not rocket science, you know, so we're not really cerebral. We're not really bass. We're kind of just in that sweet spot, you know, so um, we, we like where we're at. I can't complain about that either. <laughs> there was a there was a stat that came out just a few weeks ago. It said like hard rock and metal is now once again the fastest growing genre. Um, I guess sales wise is probably what they're basing that on. You know, so that pendulum just swings. That's so crazy. You know, it's it's interesting because here we are on we're on public radio right now, and uh, we consider ourselves an alternative band or like a mm -hmm. from the punk underground from the art punk scene actually. But strangely enough, we get asked to do metal festivals. Yeah. So, like, we're the only women on the metal festival, and they treat us great. And, you know, the tribalism of metal is amazing. And once you're – it's like it's like share fans. Once they love you, like, they will love you forever, <laughs> you know. So um, – I am very pleased that metal is growing, and I think there's a lot of people in metal who are actually politically really hip. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's great. Yeah. I should also bring up, uh, aside from that, uh, part of this, part of the reunion and everything that's happened with L7 stems from a documentary that is on Netflix. Uh, Netflix rejected it, oh. and it's oh. funny too. And it's funny too because they have a female programmer who supposedly is a feminist, and she. Uh, rejected our film. So there you go, you know, but uh, it's on Hulu and it's on um, Amazon Prime. And uh, yeah, it's from our footage from the 90s. We had a camcorder and we were shooting all the time. And so the bulk of the material is from our own footage. Why would anybody reject? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still stuck on that. Especially you know, a feminist. I yeah, mean, come on. No joke. So, but, so the reunion sort of, as I read, it, it kind of comes from that coming out and saying, well, let, let's put this together. What were those early sessions like? I mean, did you all, was it toes in the water or did you dive straight in? Well, for the documentary, we all did our interviews separately, but I was the only one who was hearing all of them. So Susie got really vulnerable on hers. And so when she got vulnerable, I was like, okay, I'm going to let my guard down too, because this is a doc and we should, you know, be as truthful as possible, you know. Then I kind of let my guard down about how, how painful it was for the breakup mm -hmm. and, our, and the loss of our friendship and all that stuff. So yeah, but first we got together kind of doing that. I started emailing them on that and then it was approaching them to discuss a possible reunion. And we didn't have a manager to do it at the time. So I was the one in the hot seat making the phone call, not knowing if I was going to be hung up on or whatever. But I did some Oprah and Deepak meditation sessions. If you've never done those, they're fantastic. And I got up the courage to uh, call my ex-bandmates. And so now, you know, chapter two, I mean, are th does it feel like the old days or does it feel like this is different and, and fresh? It feels like a victory lap and it feels like it just seems like people are starved in the audience, you know, it, and it's it's a mixture of older people and younger people. So um, I don't know. It's just incredible that our older fans have stuck with us for so long. And it's so incredible that the younger fans even know about us. So it's pretty it's a pretty surreal gratitude moment each time we get on stage. One of my favorite songs on this new record happens to be one of the uh, the latest singles and everything. Um, Stadium West, the hook isn't even an actual word, is it? It's it's like a sound. Oh, uh, where, where, where? Yeah, 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 that's Susie playing the lead on that. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, the song is about using your, you know, everybody feels really kind of beat down sometimes, and but you, especially about political things and social things, and you can use your wit as a weapon. And we're not powerless. And so Stadium West is about, it sounds like a violent song, but it's actually uh, just getting some creative weapons for good instead of crappy things. So it, it is kind of interesting the way the timing worked out. I, I don't know if you plan that, but the new album comes, you know, exactly 20 years after the last record and, and talking about the Slap Happy album that came out in 1999. Which I, I think I've heard you say is one of your favorite. You, you, like you have a, a high high regard. You, you hold that one, I think, a bit more than uh, people expect because that was the last one and then the band was over. Yeah, and we did that all ourselves. We, we had been dropped by Warner Brothers. 
We had we fired our manager. There was a complete cleaning house, and which got us nowhere. But <laughs> uh, we made that album by ourselves, and a, a friend of ours just produced it for free. Brian Hot, an angel. So we did that, and we just uh, I like that record because you know our records are like our children, which none of us have. So um, they, our records have to be our children, and uh, this one's a particularly um, creative one, and also. A little bit, you know, this one didn't go to Harvard, <laughs> but but they're colorful. So, yeah, so that's our slap happy it, it, it did come right at the end of an era, but still in an era where the importance of being on a major label, if you weren't, then you barely existed, which we know now as we look back that that wasn't the truth at all. There were so many great albums that weren't released on major labels, but but I think, you know, it's sort of in the, in the wide spectrum at the time. That, that's how it was looked. So so having been out of the deal and been independent and doing it all yourself, did you feel like you were starting over to do it again? It could, or did you see that the end was in sight, like maybe this is the end of the run? We felt like uh, we were hopeful that some miracle could happen, but it was, fe- it was feeling like the wheels were falling off because there was no money. Mm-hmm. Like when, once you have no bread and you're hitting, you're, you're approaching 40, you're kind of, you know, in your late 30s, it's like, oh, man you know, this is, we've got to make an adjustment here. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a scary time because our skill level set is like in the real world. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I'm pushing buttons over crazy. here. I get yeah, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. No. I totally and, understand. It, 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 and it is a good record and, and probably one of the more unheard records of your catalog, unfortunately. I mean, there's so, it, it was sort of a different sounding band and, and in some, it seemed like you guys were trying things that you hadn't tried yet, you know, but... Uh, but we I mean, were trying stuff, different stuff just for kicks because we're actually, our, our tastes in music wide uh, are very wide in range and yet to be this rock band that we started out as, like I said before, we had to be very tough cookies and kind of devoid of melody at times. Like our early stuff i'm just like wow where are the hooks like we were just like all about distortion and like presenting this wall of grime and then (laughs) over over time we started adding more melody and and more studio trickery which we enjoy so back up five years to 1994 and that's when the hungry for stink record came out which so this is your first record post breakthrough you know pretend we're dead had happened I feel like for a lot of bands and a lot of artists that I've talked to, there was an expectation to match the sound of the day. You know, you talk about you know yourself as an alternative band, but as grunge was the hip word at the time, was that pressure thrown on you all for the for the Hungry record? Quite a few people thought that we were going to be the next Nirvana, and uh, there were there were expectations of that, and we don't really know where that came from. But um, I think that you know, it's my opinion. It, look, band, bands don't sell records. Record companies sell records. So it's like you just make your record, mm-hmm. and it's their job to sell it. And I I like every one of our records. So it's like, you know, it's their fail, not our fail, if, if that record didn't do as well as our previous one, which it didn't. But it had great songs on it. So I mean, just naming the singles here, too. Uh, Andre, yeah. uh, Stuck Here Again, and Can I Run, I think all got the official releases, and they're all monsters. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, you know. It was a good record. Some people's favorite record yeah. by L7. Feel My Fire went to get a second life when Prodigy covered it on Fat of the Land, which was a breakthrough record for them too. Yeah, and and sort of a sort of a different world. I mean, they were coming at it from the, from a dance you know side of things at that point. Aggressive, aggressive industrial dance. Yeah, and we didn't even know that they had covered it. And we were in France, and our uh, French promoter played it for us he's like have you heard the prodigy covering and we're like what and he played it for us and we were just standing around the boom box like oh my god this is amazing we were so flattered and it was such a different take on the song and they sold a gazillion records and them covering that song got us out of the red with our publishing deal so we still would have been, you know, breaking rocks in the hot sun uh, with our publishing wow. <laughs> deal. And, you know, because I, I think, I don't know if they'd sold 10 million records. Or... It was a lot. It was a lot. It was a and, lot. <laughs> and it wasn't even a single for them. It was just like the last track on side B, you know. And, uh, yeah, that was that was really great. And it, it, that's the only cover on that record that I, that I remember. It's not like they did a handful. Like, that's this is the song they're it's saying really we're bu- going to. It's really bizarre. Yeah. I mean, no connection. <laughs> we, you know, British guys, uh-huh. you know, they were just 
fans. So uh, that was really cool. It didn't make us rich, but it, it got us out of the red. And so. Of course, uh, we lost Keith Flint uh, recently. I know. What a bummer. Yeah. Did you did you know? Uh, did you have any history with them in that way? We played a festival, a couple festivals with them in Germany uh, with Bowie headlining, which was amazing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. And um, we had gotten bouquets from our, uh, our, our French promoter, and I gave one to Bowie, and I gave one to Keith from The Prodigy. So uh, they were both very happy, and I was so happy to present them both <laughs> these bouquets of flowers because that's how I roll. What so, a day. What a day. What a life. What a career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Well, I think we'll end with that, with uh, the, the song that Prodigy covered. We'll do the original here with uh, with Fuel My Fire from that Hungry for Stink record. Uh, but before that, Danita, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Kyle. We really appreciate the support, man. Yeah. Anytime. Keep the music coming. I All mean, right. uh, if it's a victory lap, I hope this victory lap sticks around for a few more albums. Yeah, uh, I hope it's a hundred yard, not a ten yard. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and my thanks to Danita Sparks of L7 for dropping by the WFPK Studios for that one right there. Again, the new L7 album is called Scatter the Rats. It's out now. Now, I'd caught up with Danita a couple years before this by phone when L7 had just put out uh, some of the first new music since their reunion. So I wanted to include that interview here as well. And and we do talk more about the reunion, uh, about the first song that we heard from them called Dispatch from Mar-a-Lago what that song means and what it doesn't mean. And we also hear more about the documentary that got the band back together uh, called Pretend We're Dead. So stick around for part two here of Kyle Meredith with L7. How are you doing? And I'm, I'm just so excited that this is all happening, that there is an actual huge reason to be talking to you these days. Yes, there is. Nice a lot going here. on. Yeah. First off, I figure like where we should probably start off, you know, L7 is back together. It's not a brand new thing. It's it's now been a few years happening and, and in the making with the tour starting first. But I'd kind of be curious, like, when did you guys, when did you really start considering firing this back up? I think it was, um, I had been doing the Facebook page for a couple of years just to sort of archive photos of us. And I saw a huge outpouring of fans and not just older ones who had seen us before, but fans who had never seen us, like younger people. And I just thought, it's, it's, and, and every other day they'd be like, reunion, you know, and it's not anything we ever sort of planned on doing. But when we discussed the idea, we were all in. So we figured better do it now because we're not going to be able to do it probably in, you know, five years or something. I mean, obviously, it, it had been happening a lot. A lot of the bands from uh, from your era had been reuniting. Did did that play any part into it? Were you able to look at them and go, well, this is working. You know, it's working for these folks, so why not? Yeah, you know, I've never been a big fan of bands reuniting. But I'm really glad that I did get to see the Sex Pistols and I got to see the Stooges. So, you know, as a fan, I dig it. As a band member, I was I was reluctant because you don't know you don't know if you can be as good as you were or uh, as exciting. But I think I think we're playing really well. So fans seem to like it. I say so. I mean, this first single. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's huge. You dig it. The song is kind of about like the guys who like like Trump's. Secret Service people or people in the military or people who are like who kind of have to pay attention to his communications, to his tweet. And if you're one of those agents, you've got to read every tweet. And it's like, is Miss America? I mean, is Miss Universe getting fat or are we under attack? And when is it like a legit alert? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of about the people who um, who who must follow him on Twitter because that's their job. And it's this sort of idea of a maybe a boy crying wolf and when's it going to be legit. And then eventually um, an angry mob does storm the gates of Mar-a-Lago. So that's what it's about. It's yeah. not about us trashing Mar-a-Lago. It's about an angry mob doing it. I feel like we could do this. You and I could do this interview on, on any day, any different day than even today. And I could come up with different talking points to go along with everything you just said. But with today... You know, first off, what I, there, he's just said something about the calm before the storm, and and nobody, and, and it's what you're talking about. Like, how's a Secret Service member supposed to take that? You know, no one yeah, even what knows what that, that threat means. What but, does that mean? Like, it's how are we supposed to be prepared? <laughs> you know, it's like it's crazy talk. And we didn't, we didn't. You know, the the song is a fun, absurd mm-hmm. track. Mm-hmm. We're not trying to make a very heavy statement here. 
it's just sort of in response to the insanity, you know? So we did, uh, we didn't get heavy with it. We just went <laughs> kind of for the, the scenario of in my room, flying the drone, right, you know, right. It's almost little like... blue birds blowing up my phone. It's like, <laughs> here comes the tweets. So, um, that's, where we're at but it, i mean it's i don't know i i do a lot of interviews and and most of the conversations i'm having these days of course somehow veer towards this uh you know politics and music are are old bedfellows you know it's it's been happening for a long time and and i'd read that you guys kind of went into this with sort of the absurdity in mind but at the same time like even knowing that i i wanted to throw my fist in the air for you guys you know it's sort of <laughs> You know, because I, you know, I feel like we're, I feel like we're, you know, all you and I at least are all fighting on the same side, uh, and 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 even the absurd stuff still ends up saying so much. You know, as we look back at twenty years of the Daily Show, you know, the absurd stuff almost says it all these days. Yeah, yeah, and you know, we didn't. The the our documentary was screened four days after the election in mm-hmm. New York City, and it was the first screening of the doc, and people were just so devastated, and we really didn't set out to write a song about uh, the president, but we felt it would be negligent if we didn't. There were so many of our fans like literally grabbing onto our arms, save us, you know? So, uh, you know, this is, um, this is the way we wanted to do it, kind of get it out of the way. And then uh, we'll see what else is written down the line. But this was sort of our, you know, coming out blazing (laughs) with that. I mean, so you guys, you you reunited in in 2014 and, and, and now here's this song, but I will say the necessity of L7 at this moment of time, you know, it, it, it is um, pretty well timed, I, I would say, because when you look back at your history, and of course, you know, th- there is a, a big notable point uh, because of Rock for Choice that you helped yeah. start. And again, I can even look at the news today and say, and, and here he's pushing through something that makes it harder for, for women to get uh, birth control through the Affordable Care Act. You know, yeah, you know. I mean, you know, again, we, we did discuss look, is this the first song we want to come out with? It's topical. That's not a thing. We don't usually do a topical material that can be dated, you know, but we were so like praying that the hurricane did not hit (laughs) Mar-a-Lago and we were praying that he did not get impeached before we could get this track out. We felt so urgent, like, God, if he gets impeached, this whole track is like screwed, you know, (laughs) like we'll have nothing, you know? So um, we, we felt an urgency to get this out. And we also felt that even though it is topical, I think we're one of the few bands who could actually sort of pull this off Mm -hmm. because we've always had a bit of humor uh, to our political sentiments. Mm -hmm. Like we had a a song, Wargasm, with the line, you know, tie a yellow ribbon around the amputee. So, you know, there's always, even though that is not funny, there is kind of a, um, a sardonic nature to our uh, political or social commentary. I mean, it's one of the reasons that's why I've always appreciated has. you all. For well, that thank stuff. you. Yeah, uh, the great. Um, I mean, the, the, that's always all the punk side of you guys, uh, and you, you know, you sort of came from an art punk uh, scene and got lumped in with, uh, you know, a generic term like grunge. But, but it's that humor w- w- and whatever, however. I don't know, seeing that fit into whatever you want to put the label on, which means much less these days than it used to. And I think that's really fun. But, yeah, uh, I think that the I think that the art punk scene also had an appreciation of the absurd, and which I think we've always had as well. So yeah. it, it kind of fits in there. What we've always been very appreciative of is that we we cross into the metal scene, we cross into the punk scene, the art scene. So it's it's pretty cool. Like I, in one week, we got an offer for um, a festival in Mexico City called Heaven and Hell, and it's a metal festival. And in this week, we got an offer to play John Waters' birthday card. So <laughs> we're right there. Yeah, you know, like we we get we we've got the best of both worlds right there. So we we are filled with gratitude. But I did want to bring up the documentary. No, pretend that we're dead, um, which I, I haven't been able to see yet. I cannot wait to see this. But if, when you guys are looking back on that, is, is it really about the band? Because, and, and maybe it is, but I, I was sort of wondering because the, the idea of L7 as a band has been one thing to me as a fan, but it's also been so much more. And it's because of what the things that you were just saying, because you fit into so many different scenes, because there was sort of a larger story to tell, you know, with, with the activism and things like that. So I'd kind of be curious, does the documentary hit on all of that? 
It does. Uh, the documentary hits on all of that, and it's supported by the fil- the home movie footage that we've had all these years. So yes, it does tell our story, but it's also a really cool time capsule of that era because videotape was cheap. Like once we bought the camera, the videotape was cheap, so we could film a lot. You know, it was before people had cell phones, and you still had to pull over at a truck stop if you needed to make a- an emergency call or hitch a ride to a truck stop if your van broke down. So we were forced, we were very engaged with each other. Even if we were mad at each other or in a big fight or something, we had to engage. We couldn't check out. So it was an interesting time and it was because we could capture that on film. So it's, it's, it's a cool little, you know, chunk of that era. When you're looking back at that and digging through all of that and now here you are reunited and, and looking forward, I mean, does that past weigh on you at all? Like, do you have to consider that as you move forward? I don't think so. I think maybe the past weighed on it a little bit more in our absence. But now the fans have been so great. The media seems like they've strangely matured in a way. They're not as obsessed on our gender that they used to be. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of considered more of a um, sort of a a legacy band, which is amazing, as opposed to an all-female band. Because the gender tag was something that... It was tough to shake. You know, it was either we were a grunge band or an all-female band, and now we're just sort of, a, you know, American rock band or rock band, you know, so that's kind of cool. Uh, so this is one single, um, and I hear there is another single on the way. Uh, I, I, of course, have to ask the question, have you guys been talking about what happens after that if, if there's an album? Well, we're not. We're trying not to put too much pressure on us. Like, even when we reunited in 2015, you know, I approached, I approached everybody and said, let's just play the old stuff. Let's not worry about doing any writing. Let's just have fun and play the hits, you know. But now that we've been doing that, it's sort of like, well, you know, all of a sudden we find ourselves jamming at soundcheck or at rehearsal and just kind of goofing off and, and doing some writing. So we're going to release another single and then we'll see where it goes. But I don't want to put the pressure on us because I think it, right now we're living in a real cool time capsule of like being able to release a track whenever the hell you want to Mm -hmm. and you don't have to have that four-month build-up for print press like you used to have to back in the day. You'd record something and have to wait four months. So, um, you know, for Rolling Stone to catch up with their with their issue, you know. Right. So um, now it's just more, much more immediate. And so that's really exciting. So we may drop a few more singles, I don't know, without even talking about doing an album yet or something. I, I'm not sure. I'm just happy to have new music from you guys. I'm happy that you're doing anything and everything right now. So I'll take it how I can right get on. it at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything you can tell us about the new single, or, or, or we gotta wait and be surprised? You gotta wait and be surprised, but I think you'll dig the. I think you'll dig it, and I think you'll dig the title. But I can't tell you what that is. All but right. um, it's not going to be Dispatch from Mar-a-Lago. That's that's. This will be our only track about Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Danita, it was really great talking to you. Uh, thanks again for, for doing everything that you've done. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for the time, and um, uh, we'll stay in touch. All right. Sounds good. Okay, man. All right. Take care. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. 2017 interview with Donita Sparks of L7. Again, that was uh, back when they just had the uh, the single, Dispatch from Mar-a-Lago. But now they've got the full album. I hope you check it out. It's called Scatter the Rats, and, and thanks so much to Donita for all the conversation in this episode. Now, before you get out of here, again, I hope you hit the subscribe button, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're listening from. Follow along at that place uh, as we do put out interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Consequence of Sound. After that, WFPK.org is where I am every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern, where you can also find some bonus episodes of this series. Consequence of Sound has your music and film news. You can find me at Twitter at Kyle Meredith and Facebook slash Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.